continuing with rule number 11, uh, don't bother children while they're skateboarding. This section is entitled, More About Chris. Keanu, I'm watching you. That's my cat. More About Chris. My friend Chris, whom I wrote about earlier, was possessed by such a spirit to the serious detriment of his mental health. Part of what plagued him was guilt. He attended elementary and junior high school in a number of towns up in the frigid expanses of the northernmost Alberta prairie, prior to ending up in the Fairview I wrote about earlier. Fights with the native kids were a too common part of his experience during those moves. It's no overstatement to point out that such kids were, on average, rougher than the white kids, or they were touch touchier, and they had their reasons. I knew this well from my own experience. I um, substitute teach in uh, Hawaii, and uh, there's in the public school, school system, there's very few Caucasian students, and maybe like one out of a hundred. And a lot of them, the, the few Caucasian students there are, they have it a little bit hard, they have it harder than the other students. I uh, just pull this thing on this. I had a rocky friendship with a Metis kid, Renee Heck. Names and other details have been changed for the sake of privacy. When I was in elementary school, it was rocky because the situation was complex. There was a large cultural divide between Renee and me. His clothes were dirtier. He was rougher in speech and attitude. I had skipped a grade in school and was, in addition, small for my age. Renee was big, smart, good-looking kid, and he was tough. We were in grade six together in a class taught by my father. Renee was caught chewing gum. Renee, said my father, spit that gum out. You look like a cow. Ha ha, I laughed under my breath. Renee the cow. Renee might have been a cow, but there was nothing wrong with his hearing. Peterson, he said, after school, you're dead. Early in the morning, Renee and I had arranged to see a movie that night at the local movie theater, the gym. It looked like there was, th it looked like that was off. In any case, the rest of the day passed quickly and unpleasantly, as it does so when threat and pain lurk. Renee was more than capable of giving me a good pounding. After school, I took off for the bike stands outside the school as fast as I could, but Renee beat me there. We circled around the bikes, him on one side, me on the other. We were <laughs> characters in Keystone Cops. As long as I kept circling, he couldn't catch me, but strategy couldn't work forever. I yelled that I was sorry, but he wasn't mollified. His pride was hurt, and he wanted me to pay. I crouched down and hid, and hid behind some bikes, keeping an eye on Renee. Renee, I yelled, I'm sorry I called you a cow. Let's quit fighting. He started to approach me again, I said. Renee, I'm sorry I said that, really, and I still want to go to the movie with you. This wasn't just a tactic. I meant it. Otherwise, what happened next would not have happened. Renee stopped circling. Then he stared at me. Then he broke into tears. Then he ran off. That was something native white relationships in a nutshell in our hard little town. We never did go to a movie together. When my friend Chris got into it with native kids, he wouldn't fight back. He just didn't feel that his self-defense was morally justified, so he took his beatings. We took their land, he later wrote. That was wrong. No wonder they're angry. Over time, step by step, Chris withdrew from the world. It was partly his guilt. He developed a deep hatred for masculinity and, and masculine activity. He saw going to school or working or finding a girlfriend as part of the same process that had led to the colonization of North America, the horrible nuclear stalemate of the Cold War, and the despoiling of the planet. He had read some books about Buddhism and felt that the negation of his own being was ethically required in light of the current world situation. He came to believe that the same applied to others. Oh, okay. So now that I'm on rule number 11 for Jordan Peterson's 12, rule for, 12 rules for light, I can see why so many people have mentioned incels liking this book. Because this is the first thing that had any even closely referenced to an incel in the room. <clears throat> okay. When I was an undergraduate, Chris was, for a while, one of my roommates. One late night, we went to a local bar. We walked home afterwards. He started to snap the side view mirrors of our parked cars, one after the other. I said, quit that, Chris. What possible good is it going to do to make people who own those cars miserable? He told me that they were all part of the friendly human activity that was ruining everything, and that they deserved whatever they got. I said that taking revenge on people who were just living normal lives were not going to help anything. And uh, people probably got this guy an incel, which he's not. This guy's voluntarily celibate, the person that Dr. Peterson is talking about. And he's more of a sociopath. 
Years later, when I was in graduate school in Montreal, Chris showed up for what was supposed to be a visit. He was aimless, however, and lost. He asked if I could help. He ended up moving in. I was married by then, living with my wife, Tammy, and our one-year-old daughter, Michaela. Chris had also been friends with Tammy back in Fairview and had held out hopes of more than a friendship. That complicated the situation even more, but not precisely in the manner you might think. Chris started by hating men, but he ended up by hating women. He wanted them, but he had rejected education and career and desire. He smoked heavily and was unemployed. Unsurprisingly, therefore, he was not much of interest to women. That made him bitter. I tried to convince him that the path he had chosen was only going to lead to further ruin. He needed to develop some humility. He needed to get a life. One evening, it was Chris's turn to make dinner. When my wife came home, the apartment was filled with smoke. Hamburgers were burning furiously in the frying pan. Chris was on his hands and knees, attempting to repair something that had come loose in the legs of the stove. My wife knew his trick. She knew he was burning dinner on purpose. He resented having to make it. He resented the feminine role, even though the household duties were split to a reasonable manner, even though he knew per that perfectly well. He was fixing the stove to provide a plausible, even credible excuse for burning the food. When she pointed out what he was doing, he played the victim, but he was deeply and dangerously furious. Part of him, and not the good part, was convinced that he was smarter than everyone else. It was a blow to his pride that she could see through his tricks. It was an ugly situation. Tammy and I took a walk up towards the local park the next day. We needed to get away from the apartment, although it was 35 below, bitterly, frigidly cold, humid, and foggy. It was windy. It was hostile to life. Living with Chris was too much, Tammy said. We entered the park. The trees forked their bare branches upward through the damp gray air. A black squirrel, tail hairless for mange, gripped a leafless branch, shivered violently, struggling to hold on against the wind. What was it doing out here in the cold? Squirrels are partial to hibernators. They only come out in the winter when it's warm. Then we saw another, and another, and another, and another, and another. There were squirrels all around in the park, all particularly hairless, tails and bodies alike, all wind blown on their branches, all shaking and freezing in the deathly cold. No one else was around. It was impossible. It was inexplicable. It was exactly appropriate. We were on the stage at an absurd in play. It was directed by God. Tammy left soon after with our daughters for a few days elsewhere. Sometimes God will show you things like that in nature. Just like the storm right now that we're getting. Near Christmas time that same year, my younger brother and his new wife came out to visit from Western Canada. My brother also knew Chris. They all put on their winter clothes in preparation for a walk around downtown Montreal. Chris put on a long, dark winter coat. He pulled a black toque, a brimless knitted cap, far down over his head. His coat was black, as were his pants and boots. He was very tall and thin and somewhat stooped. Chris, I joked, you look like a serial killer. Ha, bloody ha. The three came back from their walk. Chris was out of sorts. They were strangers in his territory. Another happy couple. It was salt in his wounds. The three came back from their walk. Chris was out of sorts. There were strangers in his territory. Another happy couple. It was salt in his wounds. This guy, Chris, uh, what was he going to say? Well, um, yeah, he, he's so depressed and he's smoking and not working and hates the world and everything. And he's like, getting bundling up for winter. He's living in like a climate that's not, human beings aren't suitable to live in. He's living in Canada. You know, if you want to change your life, dude, quit smoking and move to a warmer climate, plain and simple. Even if you gotta like live on a beach. But this Chris guy, it doesn't look like it's going good. Let's see what happens. We had dinner, pleasantly enough. We talked and ended the evening, but I couldn't sleep. Something wasn't right. It was in the air. At four in the morning, I had had enough. I crawled out of bed, I knocked quietly on Chris's door, and went in without waiting for an answer to his room. He was awake on the bed, staring at the ceiling, as I knew he would be. I sat down beside him. I knew him very well. I talked him down from his murderous rage. Then I went back to bed. He talked him down from a murderous rage? And slept. The next morning, my brother pulled me aside. He wanted to speak with me. We sat down. He said, What the hell was going on last night? I couldn't sleep at all. Was something wrong? I told my brother that Chris wasn't doing so well. I told him that he was lucky to be alive, that, that we all were. The spirit of Cain had visited our house, but we were left unscathed. Maybe I picked up some change and scent that night when death hung in the air. Chris had a very bitter odor. He showered frequently, but the towels and the sheets picked up the smell. It was impossible to get them clean. It was the product of a psyche and a body that did not operate harmoniously. A social worker I knew, who also knew Chris, told me of her familiarity with that odor. Everyone at her workplace knew of it, although they only discussed it in hushed tones. They called it the smell of the unemployable. Soon after this, I finished my postdoctoral studies. Tammy and I moved away from Montreal to Boston. We had our second baby. 
Now and then, Chris and I talked on the phone. He came to visit once. It went well. He had found a job at an auto parts place. He was trying to make things better. He was okay at that point, but it didn't last. I didn't see him in Boston again. Almost 10 years later, the night before Chris's 40th birthday, as it happened, he called me again. By this time, I had moved from my family into Toronto. He had some news. A story he had written was going to be published in a collection put together by a small but legitimate press. He wanted to tell me that. He wrote good short stories. I had read them all. We had discussed them at length. He was a good photographer, too. He had a good creative eye. The next day, Chris drove his old pickup, the same battered beast from Fairview, into the bush. He ran a hose from the exhaust pipe to the front cab. I can see him there, looking through the cracked windshield, smoking, waiting. They found his body a few weeks later. I called his dad, my beautiful boy, he sobbed. Recently, I was invited to give a TEDx talk at a nearby university. Another professor talked first. He had been invited to speak because of his work, his genuine, genuinely fascinating technical work with computational intelligent surfaces, like computer touchscreens, but capable of being placed everywhere. He spoke instead about the threat of human beings posed to the survival of the planet. Like Chris, like far too many people, he had become anti-human to the core. He had not walked as far down the road as my friend, but the same dread spirit animated them both. He stood in front of a screen displaying an endless slow pan of blocks of long Chinese high-tech factory. Hundreds of white-suited workers stood like sterile, inhuman robots behind their assembly lines, soundlessly inserting piece A into slot B. He told the audience, filled with bright young people, of the decision he and his wife had made to limit their numbers of children to one. He told them it was something they should all consider if they wanted to regard themselves as ethical people. I felt that such a decision was properly considered, but only in his particular case, where less than one might have been even better. The many Chinese, that's kind of a mean thing for him to say, the, to many Chinese students in attendance sat stolidly through his moralizing. They thought, perhaps, of their parents' escape from the horrors of Mao's cultural revolution and its one-child policy. They thought, perhaps, of the vast improvement in living standard and freedom provided by the same factories. A couple of them said as much in the question period that followed. Would have the professor reconsidered his opinions if he knew where such ideas can lead? I would like to say yes, but I don't believe it. I think he could have known, but refused to. Worse, perhaps, he knew but didn't care, or knew and was headed there, voluntarily, in any case. Well, um, that was a very interesting section from Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. Uh, that was from rule number 11, don't bother children while they're skateboarding. My name is Gregory Brandt. I'm also a writer. I wrote a book called Gonzo Education. You can also find it under Homeless College Student. It's a memoir. I'm really proud of it. It starts when I drop out of high school and it ends when I graduate from one of the top uh, American universities. I appreciate you watching. If you haven't already, click the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button. Thanks again.